we turn to you. When we see you, we find strength to face the day. In your presence, all our fears are washed away. Washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna. You are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praise. Hosanna, Hosanna, come every way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. We turn as we gather to worship the Lord together. I uh, want to extend a special uh, greeting to guests that are with us today. I know with the uh, DeCams and uh, Profession of Faith and Baptism, we've got uh, DeCams and Christians with us, and uh, uh, it's just great to have the congregation gathered today. And um, a couple announcements for you this morning, if you would just uh, keep these in mind, especially... I'm going to remind all of our members, take a look at your bulletin. There's an awful lot uh, going on. Um, in your uh, mailboxes this week, there's a letter from Pastor Jack, who will be filling in for me for the next uh, three months, if you want to take a look at that. And then on the back side, just a few things so that we uh, have communicated well with each other about uh, what's going on in these, these three months. Um, of course, I can't remember the other one that I was supposed to say. Oh, yes. Um, November 1st. 
the uh, Judson Worship Choir is going to be with us. It's just starting to come out if you want to see what they do. Uh, it, I think the video is attached on our Facebook page. It will, it will be attached soon to our uh, uh, website. But uh, Elizabeth Van Bruggen is part of this uh, Judson Worship Choir. They're going to be with us on a Thursday night, November 1st. A uh, couple things going on with that. There'll be a youth group fundraising dinner, and then the concert, and then we'll need a few people to host There's 70 students. So, um, and I think we're going to try to get some people from other churches as well, but we need some places to uh, host these students. And it's a great thing. Having been on these tours in college, it's a, it's a lot of fun, um, but it's a lot of fun for the hosts as well to have two, four, six uh, college students in your house and uh, get to know them a little bit. So, with those thoughts in mind, let's uh, come into worship together. Would you pl- too fast? Would you please stand and uh, receive God's greeting as we enter into worship this morning, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ? Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord our Savior Jesus Christ, through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who's present and active in your hearts and lives. Amen. You take a moment this morning and uh, greet those who have gathered with you uh, as we enter into worship today. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sweating so bad. I took my glasses off. And, uh, it was fogging up. So I'm like, then I forgot. I know. Uh, all the embarrassments. <laughs> Our call to worship comes from Psalm 34, 1 through 3. Let us respond to God's invitation to worship. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. And the Lord my soul will boast. The humble will hear and rejoice. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together.
my strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forever Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Worship Your holy name. Lord, I'll worship Your holy name. never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name worship your holy name worship your holy name a wise woman Julian of Norwich said the highest form of prayer is to the goodness of God. God desires that our soul cling to him with all of its strength, in particular that it clings to his goodness. For all of the things our minds can think about, God is thinking upon his goodness that pleases him most and brings the most profit to our soul. May his praise be ever on our lips. Your love is devoted Like a ring of solid gold Like a vow that is tested Like a covenant of old And your love is enduring Through the winter rain And beyond the horizon With mercy for today Faithful you have been Faithful you will be You pledge yourself to me And it's why I sing Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips Ever be on my lips Your praise will Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. You father the orphan, your kindness makes us whole, and you shoulder our weakness. And your strength becomes our own Now you're making me like you Clothing me in white Bringing beauty from ashes For you will have your bride Free of all her guilt And rid of all her shame And known by a true name And it's why I sing your praise Ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will 
ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, and you will be praised, and you will be praised with angels and saints. Worthy are you, Lord, and you will be praised, and you will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing, Worthy are you, Lord, you will be praised, and you will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing, Worthy are you, Lord. With angels and saints, we sing, worthy are you, Lord. And it's why I sing, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips. Maybe seated. In her book, 1000 Gifts, Ann Voskamp encourages that no matter the struggle, no matter the mundane, and despite our pain, we can embrace God's grace fully with an intentional lifestyle of gratitude. She says that the good news is that all those living in the shadow of death have been birthed into new life, that the transfiguration of a suffering world has already begun, that suffering nourishes grace and pain and joy are of the same heart. What in the world is grace? Everything is grace. I will lift my eyes in the darkest night, for I know my Savior lives, and I will walk with you till you see me through, and sing the songs you give. How can I keep from singing? I can sing in the troubled times, sing when I win. I can sing when I lose my step and I fall down again. I can sing because you pick me up, sing because you're there. I can sing because you hear me, Lord, when I call to you in prayer. I can sing with my last breath. 
We have great joy this morning as we have gathered in worship to hear public professions of faith from Caleb and Jesse and Michelle DeCamp, and uh, we also this morning will get to participate in the sacrament of baptism. And when we think about that sacrament, that sacrament is based on faith. Some come from other traditions where you baptize when you make a profession of faith, and we acknowledge that this person has entered into the, the family of God. We, in our Reformed understanding, have talked about the fact that, that God is a covenant God. That in the Old Testament, he used the sign of circumcision to mark a child as a part of that covenant people. And that in the New Testament, we have moved into the sign of baptism, where there's no longer blood involved, but we remember Christ's death on our behalf. And in his name, we, we place the name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit on that child. And so we have that privilege this morning first to uh, hear the professions of faith of uh, Jesse and Michelle and Caleb. And so if you guys would come and uh, join me up here this morning. Uh, congregation, if you would like to follow along, and I actually suggest you do because there's a response for you on page 964 in, the, uh, in your gray hymn book. Page 964. Today, we are privileged to welcome into the full life of the church's fellowship those who wish to confess their faith in Christ as Lord and Savior. When they were baptized, God made clear his claim on them as his own, and they were received into the church. Now they wish to share fully in the life of this congregation and of the whole church of God. And so today they will publicly accept and confirm what was sealed in their baptism, confess their faith in the Lord Jesus, and offer themselves to God as his willing servants. We thank God for having given them this desire and pray that as we now hear their confession, he will favor us with the presence and guidance of his Holy Spirit. So now, Caleb and Michelle and Jesse, you're asked to stand in the presence of God's people and to answer the following questions. First, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God sent to redeem the world? And do you love and trust him as the one who saves you from your sin? And do you with repentance and joy embrace him as Lord of your life? Second, do you believe that the Bible is the word of God, revealing Christ and his redemption, and that the confessions of this church faithfully reflect that revelation? Third, do you accept the gracious promises of God sealed to you in your baptism? And do you affirm your union with Christ and his church, which your baptism signifies? And finally, do you promise to do all you can with the help of the Holy Spirit to strengthen your love and commitment to Christ by sharing faithfully in the life of the church, honoring and submitting to its authority, and do you join with the people of God in doing the work of the Lord everywhere? Jesse, what's your answer? Yes. <laughs> Michelle, what's your answer? Caleb, what's your answer? In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, I now welcome you to the privileges of full communion. I welcome you to the full participation in the life of the church. I welcome you to its responsibilities, its joys, and its sufferings. May the peace of God, who through the blood of the eternal covenant 
brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thanks be to God. We promise you our love, encouragement, and prayers. And let us together say what we believe. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord our God, We thank you for your word and spirit through which we know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for Caleb, for Jesse, for Michelle. Lord, we pray that they may never cease to wonder at what you have done for them. Lord, we pray that you would help them to continue firmly in their faith, to bear witness to your love. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would shape their lives. Take them, good shepherd, into your care that they may loyally endure opposition in serving you. And may we, with all your children, live together in the joy and power of your Holy Spirit. We ask this, Lord Jesus, in the hope of your coming. Amen. I've asked then if they would uh, share just a couple words of uh, their faith and uh, Second Corinthians 1, verse 22. He has set his deal of ownership on us and gave us the spirit of his heart as a pledge and guarantee of what is yet to come. That kind of hit me because no matter what I do in life and any of my decisions, God will always be there. He can never separate me from him. Um, I'm going to talk for both Jesse and I because Jesse's not really a talker, so he asked me to do it, so... Um, We just wanted to share a verse about this journey that we've kind of been taking. Um, It's Matthew 6, verses 33 through 34. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough enough trouble of its own. Sorry. (laughs) Um, Just with um, having our baby girl here, we... I've really come to realize what worry is. So we just have had to really rely on God and trust God a lot. And now, you know, we're becoming a part of this church family and being able to have more family um, to rely on and help us just is exciting. And we're just excited, yes. So I'm going to really overload your hands here, um, and we'll let you sit down for just a moment. But uh, just our way of trying to encourage you in your faith. So Caleb and uh, you, you guys can do this together, right? So Lord bless you guys. And uh, if your congregation asks you just to kind of turn back a couple pages in your hymn book, we're going to look at the form for baptism, and you can have a seat for just a second. Page 960, if you just want to turn back that uh, second there. Let us hear our Lord's command concerning the sacrament of holy baptism. After he had risen victorious from the grave, Jesus said to his disciples, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to this command, the church baptizes believers and their children. Let us hear the promises of God which are confirmed in baptism. The Lord made this great promise to Abraham. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. In later years, though Israel was unfaithful, God renewed his promise through the prophet. This is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. In the fullness of time, God came in Jesus Christ to give pardon and peace to the covenant poured out for many. For the forgiveness of sins. After Jesus had risen from the dead, the apostles proclaimed, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Anticipating the fulfillment of God's promises, Paul assures us if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. These, <clears throat> these are the unfailing promises of our Lord to those who are baptized. Let us also recall the teaching of Scripture concerning the sacrament of baptism. The water of baptism signifies the washing away of our sin by the blood of Christ and the renewal of our lives by the Holy Spirit. It also signifies that we are buried with Christ. From this we learn that our sin has been condemned by God, that we are to hate it and consider ourselves as having died to it. Moreover, the water of baptism signifies that we are raised with Christ. And from this we learn that we are to walk with Christ in newness of life. All this tells us that God has adopted us as his children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. Thus, in baptism, God seals the promises he gave us when he made his covenant with us, calling us and our children to put our trust for life and death in Christ our Savior, deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him in obedience and love. God graciously includes our children in his covenant, and all his promises are for them as well as us. Jesus himself embraced his children and blessed them. The Apostle Paul said that the children of believers are holy. So just as the children of the old covenant received the sign of baptism, our children are given the sign of baptism. It was to teach our little ones that they have been set apart by baptism as God's own children. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come before you this morning. We thank you. Lord, we thank you for the promises we have in your word that you have called for yourself a people. Lord, beginning with Abraham, but through generation after generation. Lord, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, who came to conquer death and to provide forgiveness for our sins. And Lord, this morning, we come before you to baptize Sophie into your name. And Lord, into your people. And Lord, we thank you for those great promises. We pray your blessings today on our congregation as we receive her. And Lord, we pray that you would be present here with us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Jesse and Michelle, I ask if you would come back up here. And Chuck, our elder, is going to join you up here. And in a moment... Uh,
So now you're going to understand that you're going to answer questions that sound an awful lot like a lot of the ones you just answered. Because we, as we come to a baptism, it, it doesn't happen without faith. But we think about it as the faith of the parents and the faith of the congregation and the promise of God. Um, so, since you have presented Sophie Ray for baptism this morning, you're asked to answer the following questions before God and his people. First, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Accept the promises of God and affirm the truth of the Christian faith which is proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ. Second, do you believe that your children, those sinful by nature, are received by God in Christ as members of his covenant and therefore ought to be baptized? And third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit and with the help of the Christian community to do all in your power to instruct Sophie in the Christian faith and to lead her by your example, to be Christ's disciple. Do you, the people of the Lord, promise to receive this child in love, to pray for her, to help instruct her in the faith, and to encourage and sustain her in the fellowship of believers? We do, God helping us. The Lord said, let the little children come to me. And do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Sophie Ray DeCam, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your presence here among us. We thank you for the promises of Jesse and Michelle. We thank you for the promises of the congregation and family and friends who have gathered. And Lord, we thank you for your promises. We ask, Lord, that you would walk with Jesse and Michelle as they uh, seek to raise Sophie to know and to love you. Lord, we pray that you would give them all the strength and courage they need to do that. Lord, we pray for our congregation that we would take seriously our vows to walk with them. Lord, to provide teaching and encouragement for Sophie through the years. Lord, we pray for the family and friends who are here and will continue to walk with Jesse and Michelle and Sophie. And Lord, we pray that you would use them also to instruct her in the word of God, in the life of following Jesus. And Lord, we pray that you would call her to yourself and that at a certain time too, her faith would become her own and she would take that on and stand before us or before another congregation to proclaim that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Ask Chuck if he would uh, take a moment and, uh, as is our tradition, to introduce uh, Sophie to you this morning. Hang on, put my book for you. <laughs> so, you bet. All right. <laughs>
We're going to look at God's Word together today from uh, Galatians chapter 2 and then uh, from Ephesians chapter 4. Um, if you're a guest with us, I, wanna, I want two word, to give you two words before we start. Um, first of all, I forgot to ask you, it's always nice if we have an opportunity to find out who is worshiping with us. Oh, and look at this. We're back to children in worship, so let's do that first. Um, if you, or your children age three through kindergarten, are invited to uh, go down for children in worship at this point. And uh, this is our first Sunday of that this year, so we're glad to uh, be able to start that again. And uh, as they make their way out, we'll just uh, ask the Lord's blessing on them. And I did want to say two words to our guests. First of all, I forgot to ask you, if you would, uh, there's a little tear-off sheet in the front of your bulletin just to let us know who's worshiping here and for us to be able to, to greet you. We would love to uh, have you fill that out and put that in the offering plate. And so even if I see you writing down it during the message, I'll, I'll let you get away with it. Um, second thing is, uh, you join us in the midst of a series um, this fall we are looking at what we call authentic relationships. And we have some principles of authentic relationships that we have been um, talking about and trying to live out. They begin with discovery. If you're going to be somebody's real friend, you have to know them, right? And it moves into care, and it moves into what we call humility, which is uh, having our eyes open to a broader world, seeing things from another person's perspective, and also working together to, to see and to work in a broader kingdom capacity for what's going on in this world for the kingdom of God. Well, today we come to maybe one of the more difficult ones of these principles. And this is the principle of truth-telling. To forge and to be forged. And... Um, As we go into this, I guess what I want to start with is I want to remind you, and if you haven't been here, just to kind of bring this to your attention, um, the, the stories that we've been working on. We've been talking about the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and Barnabas. And just to kind of bring you up to date with these um, people, um, we're talking about what we call peer relationships, okay? If we're going to tell the truth, you know, sometimes when we tell the truth, we, we expect that from our boss. Or if we're a student, we expect it from our teacher, or an athlete expects it from a coach. And sometimes it's a little more difficult if that's turned around the other way. As teachers, if we experience that truth-telling from our students, it's a little more difficult to take. Or as bosses, if we experience that truth-telling from our employees, it's a little more difficult to take. Our hope is that when we're talking about authentic relationships, we're mainly talking about pure relationships. As we get to know one another, as we develop friendships with one another. And so these pure relationships are what's going on with Peter and Paul and Barnabas. If we start in Scripture, of course, Peter is, you know, the lead disciple. He's the one that was always out front, always speaking, sometimes in good ways and sometimes in bad ways. And Peter becomes a leader in the early church. And we looked at a couple weeks ago, um, Peter was one of the first ones whom God gave this vision and said, you need to go preach the gospel not only to people who are Jews, who grew up with the Old Testament, but you need to preach the gospel to Gentiles as well. So that's Peter. Barnabas was an early Christian in Jerusalem. And early on, he brings this offering. Uh, he sells a piece of land, and he brings the offering to the disciples, and he lays it at the disciples' feet. And you have to, in that picture, that Peter's right there. These people knew each other. A little later on, when, it come, when they come to find out in Jerusalem that some of the Jews that left after some of the persecutions weren't only telling the good news of Jesus Christ to the Jews, they were also telling it to the Gentiles. The apostles, hear Peter's name in there, sent Barnabas to Antioch, where they were telling the gospel of Gentiles. So Peter and Barnabas have had these interactions. Now, Paul and Barnabas have also had several interactions. Paul originally was one of the ones that persecuted the church. When he was converted, 
he came back to Jerusalem and nobody wanted to receive him except Barnabas went out and got to know him and brought him and introduced him to the disciples. And now a little later on when Barnabas is sent out to the church in Antioch, he goes and he gets Paul and brings him with him to Antioch to be a teacher with him. And a little later on, they all are on, they, they, Barnabas and Paul go on missionary journeys together. And one of the other key events that's in the background of the passages we're going to look at today is what they call the Jerusalem Council. Okay, so the gospel had spread to the house of Cornelius that Peter went to. It had spread to Gentiles in Antioch. And then later on, Paul and Barnabas go out and they're preaching to these other churches throughout the Mediterranean. And many people who are not Jews are coming to believe in Jesus Christ. And the church has to figure out, well, what do we do with these people? Do, they, do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? And they call this the Jerusalem Council. It's found in Acts 15. And Peter and Barnabas and Paul are all present there making this decision together with, with the whole group of the leaders of the church in Jerusalem that, no, you don't have to become a Jew in order to be a believer in Jesus Christ. Which, of course, I think probably every one of us in this room has experienced the benefits of that. That we have not followed all the Jewish laws and customs in order to be a follower of Jesus Christ. So that's the setting and then this morning, I want to look at these two passages. Um, first, from uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 25 through 27, which is kind of the, the statement. It's the proposition. Here's the, the truth that we're working with. And that goes like this. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not give the devil a foothold. That's the truth that we're applying. And now I want to pick up from Galatians. Uh, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter back to a church that he has served, and he's writing them about something that happened in this church in Antioch. Remember? I know I've thrown a lot of names at you. This church in Antioch, where Barnabas went, they sent out Paul and Barnabas. They came back. This is after the Jerusalem Council when the church has decided that no, Gentiles don't need to become Jews. And Peter has actually made his way to Antioch, and he is worshiping with this community of believers, Gentiles and Jews together in Antioch. And Paul, in his letter to the Galatians, says this. When Peter came to Antioch, read, was here in Antioch. because It wasn't right when he came. When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, from Jerusalem, before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to back off. And to separate himself. Because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. The rest of the Jews followed Peter in this hypocrisy. So that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas was led astray. So... Since I saw they were not acting according to the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We'll pause there in our reading of God's holy inspired word. So Peter and Paul and Barnabas are peers. And hearing that scripture, 
of Paul confronting Peter in front of this whole congregation there in Antioch, we can't imagine that this was a comfortable meeting. That this was something that was enjoyable either for Peter or for Paul, or for that matter for Barnabas, who has been led astray. Our first point is that not telling biblical truth has repercussions. In the Antioch church, these Gentile believers have believed early on, and years later, after the Jerusalem council has decided that these Gentiles don't need to become Jews, Peter comes to Antioch. And right away, he's eating with the Jews. This is something he had done when he went to the house of Cornelius and had done since then. But certain men came from James. Now, let's not think that these were officially sanctioned representatives of James or the early church leaders. They were not. But certain men came from Jerusalem who were more strictly Jewish. They were of the circumcision party. And when they come, Peter waffles. The other Jews joined him in his in his hypocrisy. So, first of all, Peter starts drawing back from the Gentiles. He's no longer going to eat with them. And this has repercussions. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray. And you can see forming here in this church the beginnings of a split between the Jewish believers and the Gentile believers in Antioch. There, the Jewish believers are lifted up as first-class believers, and the, the Gentile believers are second-class believers. And two of their key leaders are now in the wrong, Peter and Barnabas. Now, that could not have been a comfortable conversation for Paul, but here they were. So he says, when I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, Paul sees that there are problems going on. The church is being divided by some of their leaders not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, and it's causing division. They're adding requirements to what does it mean to follow Jesus Christ. Now, instead of just being the grace of God, you now have to become a Jew. And there's this repeated theme that if we add to the requirements of salvation, that gives the devil a foothold. Throughout the history of the Christian church, there have been different times when people have, been, have laid down other requirements for salvation other than a faith in Jesus Christ and living out that faith. And every time that gives a devil a foothold to come in and to divide the church. Adding to salvation, dividing the church. And so Paul speaks the truth. Speak truthfully to one another. And this truth-telling happens within authentic peer relationships. In our setting, we talk about small groups and we talk about other peer relationships. Here, it's Peter and Barnabas and Paul, and they are all leaders within the church. There are ongoing relationships that have, have lasted for years. And Peter and Paul and Barnabas were all on the same side of this very issue in Acts chapter 15. And Peter was one of the first ones who recognized that the gospel that Paul preached um, is a true gospel. By the way, that's our pumps downstairs, Um, this nice buzz you're hearing. When the one uh, doesn't keep up, the other one turns on and it makes an alarm. So I knew that was going to happen sometime during the service today. Um, So here we are. We've got these peers, and these relationships have grown through the years. As Barnabas has discovered Paul, as they have cared for each other, as they've shown humility to one another, as Peter was was one of the key disciples, and, and Peter lent his authority to this idea that the Gentiles did not have to become Jews. And now, some people have come from Jerusalem to the church in Antioch, and they're raising the same matter. And it's causing problems. Now, the truth is we don't start relationships with truth-telling, right? With telling difficult truths. Now, we all know people who do this. They might even be right, but they're so blunt and uncaring that we don't really care what they have to say. Uh, What's the old saying? I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. Um, We're big on relationships, but as we build relationships one with another, as we know who we are, as we care for one another— There are times when we are called to speak difficult truths to each other. We are the body of Christ together. 
And that means sometimes there are words of correction, words of guidance or encouragement that need to be, need to be spoken. And in this instance, Paul corrects. He's doing the truth-telling. He's doing the, the forging. We use the picture of the forge because it is the idea of being heated and reshaped. And it is the idea, really, of, of using the hammer. But when you think about using a hammer, it takes great skill to make something useful. I said to Peter in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How can you force the Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? Paul is wielding the hammer, and it's a heavy blow. It's a public confrontation in front of that congregation. Is that how we do this? Because just swinging wildly with a hammer can do lots of damage, right? It's so important to use the hammer wisely. Ephesians says, in your anger, do not sin. We can tell all kinds of truth that is not at all helpful. So there are three items of context that are very important. Person, place, and position. I want to walk through this with uh, Paul and Peter. The, the importance of the person. Paul knew Peter. He knew Peter's personality. Uh, from the New Testament, it looks like Peter's a pretty bullheaded guy. He's the first one to speak. He gets a lot of things right. He gets a lot of things wrong. But he's a very strong personality. And he's probably not one who uh, did a very good job of listening to hints and gentle correction. Because if you think about this, relation, this, this situation that's going on there in Antioch, I, I can't believe that Paul never said anything to Peter when he first started to withdraw from the Gentiles. I don't imagine he just, you know, let that go. I'm sure he said something to him, but it didn't work. And some people occasionally need to be hit over the head. That's the first part of the context. Who is the person you're dealing with? How will they best receive correction? Most of us aren't quite the same person Peter is. And when we wield the hammer of telling the truth, we want to forge people in the most appropriate way possible. The person. We need to know the person. That's why discovery comes before truth-telling. Second, we need to know the place. Um... Is this a private matter? Then deal with it privately. There, there's no reason to the, extend the knowledge of any wrongdoing or any weakness or any failure. We are to protect our friends and our fellow believers. Matthew 18 says, If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. Point it out just between the two of you. But, Peter's sin has, at this point, been public. People know what Peter's doing. People are following his example. It's a public sin, and as broad as that his leadership in the wrong direction has been, the correction needs to be that broad. His withdrawal from the Gentile believers has caused others to do the same thing, and this church in Antioch is in serious danger of a church split, of a loss of the freedom that we find in our forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And this required a public confrontation. That's not the normally the way we want to do it. We don't normally want to deal with our, our dirty laundry in front of the whole congregation. We don't, want to, we don't want to, and we should not make that circle any bigger than it needs to be. But when Peter's offense is having church-wide implications, then the correction also needed to be church-wide. And finally, with position. We need to understand Peter's position as a leader. People were following his example. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy, and even Barnabas was led astray. Those who are in leadership positions need to set right examples, because they are going to set examples. And so their mistakes are more visible. Correction needs to be more visible. Let's bring it to today. If your brother or sister sins against you, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. We are called. We're called to correct, to confront, to teach one another, to provide perspective, to provide wisdom. That, that's truth-telling. That is wielding the hammer on the forge and shaping people. Let me share with you this short article from Today's Christian Woman. It gives this example. 
When Trisha moved into Michelle's neighborhood, they became fast friends. Their personalities clicked and they had a lot in common, including church involvement and the same age children. Before long, Trisha and Michelle established a deep, heartfelt friendship. Then Michelle's husband began spending significant amounts of time out of town for work. During this time, Trisha noticed that Michelle had struck up an unusually friendly relationship with a contractor renovating her house. Almost every time Trisha looked out her front window, she saw the contractor's car in Michelle's driveway, sometimes late into the night. Trisha was heartsick. She knew Michelle was committed to her family and to God's commands. So Trisha prayed and then loved Michelle enough to confront her with her concerns. When Trisha asked Michelle about her late night visitor, she poured out her pain, her hurt, her loneliness, confiding that the new man in her life was simply a good friend. But that explanation didn't satisfy Trisha. Lovingly but boldly, she told Michelle she was playing with fire. She encouraged Michelle to slam the door on temptation and cling to the comfort only God can give a lonely, hurting heart. Trisha valued their friendship so much she was willing to risk their relationship in order to do what was best for her friend. When it comes to our friendships, we'd rather be cheerleaders than corrections officers. That's because confrontation is awkward and uncomfortable. And besides, if we confront a friend, it could damage our relationship. If we truly love people, we want what's best for them. And sometimes the best requires confrontation and discipline. Matthew 18, 15 to 17 is clear about what we must do when we see someone caught up in wrongdoing. That's from today's Christian woman. The person. Trisha knew Michelle. She knew her Christian commitment. She knew that they shared an understanding of right and wrong. She knew she could push her when she tried to say her contractor was just a friend. The place. The conversation was just between the two of them. As long as Michelle responds, there's no reason to take it any further. So much the better. A restored friend. A maintained friendship. If Michelle didn't respond, at some point she might have to get someone else involved. And a position. It's a private person. Not showing this in any leadership position. A private conversation is good. It's enough. But the more public the person, the more public the situation, the more public the restoration must be. As a pastor or a leader or, let's just put it this way. Let's just say a pastor is known for angry outbursts and they're inappropriate. If it happens at a committee meeting, well, the place to, re, to address it is with the people who are at the committee meeting. If it happens in a very public place, say a, a wedding reception, maybe there needs to be a letter to the congregation or something said in front of the congregation. Our truth-telling needs to be done in the right way for the person and for the place and for the position. But it's always based on truth. Never insinuation. Always two or three witnesses before anything is done in any public manner. So how do you approach this person? Truth-telling is so important. Because not telling the truth in a biblical way has repercussions for the individual. If Trisha doesn't confront Michelle, how long will it go on before Michelle does something to ruin her marriage? And these conversations are best with peers. The person matters. The context matters. We don't take it any farther than we need to. Don't dare speak to others until you have spoken to the person involved. That's gossip. And that we do not need. And finally, there's always, always a hope of restoration. If Peter and Paul and Barnabas can have this relationship, and we know that the relationship moved on, and they continued to be leaders in the church, not perfect leaders, but leaders in the church. We know the best can happen. Peter could be restored even in a very public 
confrontation. We can be restored. God has his care, his plan, his way for each one of us. And we want to encourage one another to walk that path. One of the reasons we encourage small groups and we encourage authentic relationships, whether they're in the group or somewhere else, is because we are to live this faith together. To walk with one another. I mean, even this morning, we took vows with Jesse and Michelle in baptism that we would have a part in Sophie's life. We, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have parts in one another's lives. Of course, the closer relationship, the more responsibility we bear one for another. And so we encourage those close relationships. But we do have a care, a responsibility for one another as fellow believers in Jesus Christ. So, brothers and sisters, we encourage you to make these relationships, to make them authentic, to be real with one another in our families, with our friends, in our small groups, wherever those happen to be. And let the truth of Christ be your guide and your foundation. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, we do come before you this morning. We thank you for your word, which is truth. Lord, we thank you for the underlying truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you came, you as God took on human flesh. You went to the cross to pay for our sins. And Lord, our faith in you is the only way of salvation. Lord, we thank you for that. And Lord, we know also that you have called us to live in a certain way. You have given us the guidelines of your word. The Ten Commandments, love one another as we love ourselves, love you above all. Lord, we pray that we might encourage one another in walking that path, uh, joyfully whenever possible, but Lord, also to speak that truth in love when need be. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful in telling the truth of Jesus Christ in all the places where we go. Lord, may we be ready with the word, with the helping hand, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ in our neighborhood, in our workplace, in our school. Lord, we pray that we would proclaim that truth. Lord, we pray too for those that we support and send out who proclaim that truth of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would encourage Michelle in her work with the orphans, and Lord, let her see fruit on her labor. Lord, we pray for Steve and Frankie, and Lord, we pray that they would proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ boldly, even when it's, it's a risk to them. Lord, for Krista and Danny, Lord, we pray that through their relationships, they can continue to teach and to disciple, and that you would encourage them also with fruit on their labors. Lord, for Steve and Jill, we thank you for the work they do in um, providing organization and, and direction for the crew ministry. And Lord, we pray that uh, they would be encouraged by the stories they hear from the, from the campuses. Lord, we thank you that your word has gone out. Pray that it would continue to go out. And Lord, this morning we pray that you would take the truth of your gospel and Lord, you would bring it into the lives of those who need you in a special way. Lord, we think of those who are shut in in our congregation. Lord, we pray that you would encourage them each day. Lord, we pray that they would know that they are a part of the body of Christ and that they belong to you, that nothing will separate them from your love. Lord, we pray with the camp offs uh, for Denny this morning as he is hospitalized. Lord, we pray that you would just watch over him, give him the strength that he stands in need of. Lord, we pray for Sue as she goes for surgery this week. We pray that the surgery would be effective in uh, uh, relieving any pain and providing the stability and the movement for her neck. Lord, we pray that you would watch over her in that surgery as well. Lord, we thank you that Wanda can be with us today and just pray that you would continue to give her your strength. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, amen. Our offering this morning, we take for World Renew, and on a Baptism Sunday, we take a second offering for the Sheldon Christian School Foundation in the name of uh, Sophie DeCam.
in child health or a disaster response effort like drought relief, here's what happens. One dollar multiplies to a dollar sixty in impact because of the matching grants that World Renew accesses. Eight percent is put aside for future disaster response and community development programs. Ninety-two percent is invested in program and general operating support costs. World Renew directs just 18 cents of the remaining $1.48 to operating systems that will expand with us. Marketing and fundraising to stretch your dollar further. Communicating with churches, donors, and volunteers to activate prayer and engagement. And management staff, including systems and programs excellence teams. The remaining $1.29 makes World Renew's concrete presence in a poor community or disaster-affected area possible. Many relationships and partnerships are built to bring about change, and many things are needed to support the work of fighting poverty and injustice. Recovery and rehabilitation after a disaster demands new infrastructure, staff, and materials. Ultimately, your one dollar means World Renew's presence is experienced many times over as God's grace made real. This grace shines on the faces of people whose stories, once despairing, are changed into stories of hope. That's your dollar at work in the world through World Renew. I don't know if you caught all that. I know I had to watch it a couple times to uh, figure out exactly what was going on there. Uh, World Renew is a uh, Christian Reformed denominational relief ministry, and that's what our first offering is for this morning. And what they were wanting to do is say, well, where are your dollars going? And so the first thing they said was, well, there's a lot of matching funds out there. So when you give a dollar, it actually becomes a dollar sixty. And then they kind of walk through, uh, basically telling us that less than 20 cents of that dollar sixty is used for administration, and the great majority of it is passed on to uh, the work that they actually do. And so uh, it, it's one of those, yeah, there's so many numbers coming at you so quickly. I don't know if uh, followed all of that. Um, as we're closing our worship, let's, uh, as the deacons finish taking our offering, let's move into our final song this morning. Uh, Lord, speak to me that I may speak. with this example from the psalmist who writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will always be in my mouth. In the Lord my soul will boast. The humble will hear and rejoice. We will always proclaim the greatness of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord smile on you and give you his peace. Amen.